All right. Well, if you could pull your Bibles out this morning and find your way to Genesis, the 26th chapter. We have been going through the book of Genesis for quite some time now. We're taking our time. We'll go through it as slowly as the Spirit leads or as quickly as He leads. But um, we have just encountered, met Isaac and a little bit of Jacob and Esau from last week. Give me just a second here to load this up. Here we go. Electronics. All right. Well, you know what I'm going to ask you, don't you? Please stand with me. (laughs) I should have just said, find a chair and stand in front of it. I'm going to read Genesis 26, the whole chapter. We'll have it on the screen for you. You can follow along in your Bible or just on the screen. I'll read it aloud. All right, this is the word of the Lord. Now, there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven, and will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac settled in Gerar. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, She is my sister, for he feared to say my wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was attractive in appearance. You remember his father did this twice already. When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of a window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, she's your wife. How then could you say she's my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I thought lest I die because of her. Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? One of the people might have easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. And Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him, and the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants, so that the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. So Isaac uh, departed from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham his father, which the Philistines had stopped after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names that his father had given them. But when Esau's, excuse me, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of spring water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Esek, because they contended with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, saying, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. From there he went up to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham your father. Fear not, for I am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. When Abimelech went to him from Gerar with Ahuzah, his advisor, and Phicol, the commander of his army, Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me, seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? They said, We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, Let, it, let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you, and have done to you nothing but good, and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. In the morning they rose early and exchanged oaths. And Isaac sent them on their way, and they departed from him in peace. That same day, Isaac's servants came and told him about the well that they had dug and said to him, We have found water. He called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. We'll end the reading of God's word right there. You may be seated. 
If you're taking notes, I encourage you to take notes always so that you can look back during the week. The title of this sermon is Being Faithful in Little. Being Faithful in Little. Well, one day during the days of the American gold rush, there was a traveling caravan that traveled out west and came across a man who was by himself near a riverside digging a hole with a small shovel. So the head of the party stopped and asked the man, what are you doing, friend? The man said, I'm digging a well. The next day, the head of the party saw the man now gathering wood, collecting wood and cutting it to size. And so once again, he asked the lone man, what are you doing? And he said, I'm building a house. The next week, the next week later, the head of the caravan finally saw the man with a pick in a field, breaking up the field and breaking up the dirt. And so he asked him once again, what are you doing, friend? And he said, I'm sowing for a harvest. So finally, the man said, the head of the caravan, you know, this is a, this is a large plot of land and you're just one man. What do you think you're going to do here? You think you're going to survive here? And so the busy man responded, I don't know, but if I keep working, one day there'll be a city here. Well, he was right. The name of that man by himself by the riverside was John Sutter. That river is the Sacramento River and the city that exists now in the place of where he was digging and sowing and planting is Sacramento, the capital city of California, which now has a population of 2.3 million. You see, to that man in the caravan, all he saw was the guy digging. All he saw was a guy cutting, a guy sowing, a guy planting. But to John Sutter, you see, he knew that if he was committed to making small steps and not give up, one day, maybe, his labors would pay off and he would have a place where he and his family and his children could call home. Well, friends, this is a principle that applies, I think, to every area, every sphere of our lives. Whether we're setting out to start a city or begin a new job or working at our current job or raising children or being a faithful member of a local church, Jesus said in John 16 that the one who is faithful in a very little will also be faithful in much. And our next story here in Genesis Genesis illustrates this principle very well for us. Here's this snapshot of of Isaac, Abraham's son, sojourning in this land, seeking to obey God's word. By the way, amidst a fair bit of conflict, as we've seen many times before, friends, in our Genesis study, being faithful to the Lord doesn't mean that there will not be difficulty. There will not be conflict. In fact, we ought to expect it. The life of faith is marked by conflict, whether from the outside, from people, or situations, or from within side of us. And the temptation to fear and to disbelieve the goodness of God. But today I hope to show you in this chapter, if I can put this whole sermon in a sentence, that those who are faithful to the faithful in little will experience the Lord's blessing. Those who are faithful in little will experience the Lord's blessing. Several weeks ago, if you were with us, you saw this theme as we examine Abraham's servant in chapter 24, Abraham's faithful servant. And here again, we see what is possible, friends, in the life of God's people when they're faithful. With just the little bit that God gives to us. So friends, what about you? Where are you at today? Are you trying to honor the Lord in your sphere where God has placed you while facing conflict? If you're breathing in here, and I hope you all are, chances are the answer to that question is probably yes. So I encourage you, let me just encourage you to sit back, but then also lean in. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you as he speaks to you through Genesis 26 and encourages you to be faithful right where you are. 
So would you do me a favor? Would you join with me in praying and asking him for this? Holy Spirit, we just want to ask you to do this very thing. We ask that you'd help every one of us, Lord, now to listen in to what you have to say to us through the preaching of your holy, inerrant, sufficient word this morning. And I pray that for my brother or sister, my, my friend who's, who's trying to be faithful right where they are but are facing conflict, I pray that you encourage them through Isaac's story in Genesis 26. Lord, do what I pray for Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right, well, let me give you three headings, three scenes we're going to take a look at. And like a good preacher, I'll do it in the, with alliteration, okay? I'm going to give you three Fs. A famine in verses 1 through 16. A fight in verses 17 through 22, and a feast in verses 23 through 33. A famine, a fight, and a feast. All right, first one, a famine, the first 16 verses. Our story today is framed by the report of one in the land of Canaan. And by the way, the the author tells us that this this isn't the same famine that Abraham experienced in chapter 12 when he went against God's will and went down to Egypt. This is a, a different famine. Okay, and he's trying to show us this is a different story altogether that took place in the life of his son. And word around town was in those days that Egypt had more than enough food for people in famine, more than enough grain stores, and we're going to see that later on in Genesis, which is why that Isaac probably felt like, you know, I should go down to Egypt and, and, and get some food there because my fields are barren. You have to remember, the ancient Middle East was, was an agrarian culture. One's, one's very livelihood depended upon the success of their fields and, and their flocks. So because this story begins with a famine, and with Isaac at the center, it, it's preparing us for something to happen. Moses has our attention. Now there was a famine in the land. God wants to show us through his word that, just like he did last week with Rebecca's barrenness, That man's difficulty is God's opportunity. Your difficulty is God's opportunity. The Lord then appears to Isaac in verse 2. He tells him what? Specifically not to go down to Egypt as his father did. Any one of us would have said, but they have all the best grocery stores there. God, are you sure that's what you're saying to me? That this is the place where Isaac and Rebekah can go and find some help, friends. Perhaps some rest from their anxieties. But God tells them, no, I don't want you to go there. Instead, see what the Lord does. He makes a host of promises to Isaac. A host of promises much like he did when he called Abraham, his father, out of his homeland and told him to go to the land of Canaan. Notice the promises are very similar to the ones that he has made to to Abraham. And he reinforced about Abraham's life. He promises him prosperity first, doesn't he? I will bless you. He promises him a place. I will give you and your offspring these lands. He promises a people, descendants as numerous as the stars of the heavens. But notice, in addition to a prosperity and a place and a people, there's a new element to the promise that he makes to Isaac that he didn't specifically say to Abraham, although it was true. He promises him his presence. I will be with you. You see, for Abraham, God needed to reinforce throughout his life, I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to give you a son. Don't worry, I'm going to give you a son. For Isaac, God needs to reinforce to him, I am near My presence is with you. Therefore, you are safe. You're protected. I will provide for you. Friends, what a fitting word for Isaac in this season. Isaac is now fatherless, with nothing to his name, but some grass and a grave at Machpelah, where his mother is buried. Add to this now, his crops aren't growing at all. Isaac needs to have his faith stirred. He needs to hear the I wills of God. He needs to be reminded that because his dad was obedient, comprehensively obedient, in fact, that's the force of all those synonyms for God's law in in verse 5. Because Abraham was obedient, God is not going to abandon 
Abraham's son now. Friends, as an aside, let that be a testimony to those of you who are parents, who were faithful with your children as best as you could be. And they may not be walking with the Lord today, but God honors that faithfulness with legacy. Let that be a word for you. So with that reminder of God's word, Isaac obeys. He's faithful in little. He pitches his tent near the city of Gerar. He doesn't go to Egypt. He stays in the land of the Philistines. Now, that's great. That's the sunshine and rainbows. But quickly we get to verse 7 and we find out that Isaac's not as faithful as we would like him to be. Which is great because we are not either. In Gerar, he meets Abimelech, the king. Scholars think, by the way, Abimelech and Phicol are titles, different, uh, different uh, titles used by the Philistines for positions of royalty and military. So it's possibly true that these are different guys than Abraham encountered some many decades ago. And we see here that the sin of the father follows Abraham, uh, Isaac. For fear of being killed... And Rebekah taken, Isaac, just like his dad, lies about Rebekah's identity. He says, guys, this is my sister. Isaac is living in a famine and living in fear, which makes him selfish. Fear makes us selfish people. The lie might spare him, but it makes his wife vulnerable. You see, friends, God's promises that motivated his obedience to stay in Gerar. Looked like they begin to fade, don't they? Verse 8 says that they've been there a long time. So Isaac began looking around instead of looking up, which made him forget the words that God said to him, that he is committed to him, that his presence is with him, that he will protect and provide for him. But I want you to notice, guys, the emphasis is not on Isaac's actions. Despite Isaac's actions... What God says in verse 3, he does in verse 12. You see that? Look at verse 12. And Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year 100-fold. 100-fold. The Lord blessed him and the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants. No fear resulting in sinful behavior. And no famine, friends, can impede God's commitment to his people. You, listen to me. No fear and famine can impede God's commitment to you if you belong to God through Christ today. Do you hear me? This, this is the first lesson we need to take away from this story, friends. The Lord is committed to blessing his people regardless of our track record of obedience. The I wills of the Lord always override man's I will nots. It is the Lord who offers up these promises to Isaac. He is the initiator of them on the basis of his covenant that he made with Abraham and Abraham's God-enabled faithfulness to it. I think that the author here wants to remind God's people reading this account in any age, that's us here in Grace City Church, that the presence of God means the blessing of God. Whether or not blessing translates into material prosperity or something else. Now again, lest we preach a different gospel, I want to qualify those statements. This account shows us what God is able to do, not what He must or is guaranteed to do. We only have to look at uh, the different accounts of, in the wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, to see that we are not guaranteed a life of material prosperity just because we are God's people. But this account in Genesis 26 does show that because God is committed to blessing His people, when they take even the smallest steps of obedience, God moves toward us. God blesses us richly. Isaac was not perfect. He was faithful. He failed to trust God with his fears, but not perfectly, and, and definitely not perfectly. But the emphasis here is on the small steps of faith that he takes in response to God's promises. Do you see the small steps? He stays, 
and he sows. He remains and he plants. So the Lord blessed him. The Lord blessed him. And what a word this is for us this morning, Grace City Church. As we face the various types of famines in our own lives. Again, as we saw last week, barrenness and famine, it's an opportunity for God to show up to do what he promised he would do for his blood-bought sons and daughters. The problem is, is that so often our expectation of his blessing, or maybe even more simply our definition of blessing, may not quite be what his definition of blessing is. I'm reminded of Romans chapter 8. One of the richest chapters in all the Bible. So many golden nuggets of truth. We can't take, though, one golden nugget of truth and leave it. Leave another behind. Look at Romans, 28, uh, Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good for those who love God, who are the called according to His purpose. Amen. Hallelujah. We love that promise. God's working it out. Hallelujah. I'm victorious. Then you get to verse 36. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Psalm 44, 22. You can't take one and leave the other. You need both. What does that show us? It shows us that sometimes God's blessing means landing a big contract. Sometimes God's blessing means getting way more than asking price for the house. But sometimes his blessing means experiencing his tangible nearness when all the world is collapsing around us. When everything around us feels like it's falling apart with sickness or financial instability or a car accident. It was Romans 8 that gave me comfort. When I sat for two hours in an emergency room many years ago, keeled over in stomach pain, waiting for a doctor to come in. Romans 8. He will be with me. He will make this work for good. Guys, we need to redefine how we think and speak of blessing in the American church. That's such a throwaway word, isn't it? Blessed and highly favored. I'm blessed. We need to define what we're saying when we say that, guys. The reality is, is that Isaac, Isaac wasn't first blessed because he was faithful. He was blessed because God was committed to him and that God graciously chose to use him to accomplish his, his, his program. And, and we, the American church, aren't blessed because we've been faithful. In many ways, we have not been faithful, dear ones. And blessing is not always what we think it ought to look like, is it? No, but we're blessed because we've been foreknown by God and predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. We're blessed because in Christ, the promise to Isaac of God drawing near, the promise of presence is now true of us. So that when famine or fear strike, we might with weak faith hold on to the word that has been given to us and cling to its promises. And friends, because he's holding fast to you, and only because, now you can take that next trembling step of faith while you're afraid. Remember, faith is not the absence of fear. It's simply taking one step toward Christ while you're afraid. That's faith. And that means whether you're to go or to remain where you are investing, sowing in the land in front of you, just as Isaac did. And that may mean wiping little bums and washing dishes and getting up each morning to go to a job that is so stressful right now or pouring into the lives of your brothers and sisters in this church. That's what it means to be faithful in the midst of a famine. Isaac was faithful to stay and sow, and the Lord blessed him. Are we? Are we? Next, next scene, we see a fight break out. Number two. You'll note that just as quickly as 
as Isaac brought in his harvest and set his flocks to pasture, we read this little almost footnote that the Philistines envied him in verse 14. The word translated envy in the English actually isn't very strong. The word in Hebrew refers to intense jealousy. These old boys saw the hand of this God Yahweh in Isaac's life and they were jealous. They couldn't bear to see it. So Abimelech saw this, saw the potential for strife in the city of Gerar. So he approached Isaac and he said, you know, maybe it would be best for you to leave town. Your wealth, your, your sheer number of servants is a threat to our people. So what does Isaac do? Does he take his stand? Does he stand his ground? Does he say, no, I have just as much a right to be here as anybody else? No. Rather than argue, he leaves the city and he heads into the country, the Valley of Gerar. He moves into the northern Negev, which is in the Judean mountain foothills. And he returns to his father's old wells that were out there. Now remember, wells, just as crops, are very, very important in a place especially like that. If you don't have water, you don't live. Your crops are not going to live. Your, your, your animals are going to die. So Isaac sets to work on stopping them because the Philistines, probably in their envy after Abraham died, filled them up. He unstopped them and he gives them all the same names that his, his dad gave to them, which signifies ownership. It was like a contract. These are my wells. I'm naming them. Twice this happens, the Bible says. A well is found. A new well is found. Isaac begins digging it. In this one, it says that the the herdsmen of Gerar laid claim to it. Twice, Isaac names the wells, claiming them for himself. But he also is signifying the strife that he's encountering in the process, isn't he? Because he names the first Esek. If you ever want to name your child contention or challenge or dispute, name him Esek. Sounds like a modern hipster name, doesn't it? Contention. The second one, he names Sitna. Please don't name your child that. That's where we get the word Satan from, opposition, adversary. Notice, notice, friends, that in the face of opposition, Isaac doesn't provoke his contenders. Instead, he turns the other cheek and he keeps on digging. He turns the other cheek and he keeps on digging. He names the conflict for what it is. He points at it. He says, Esek, Sitna. But at the end of the day, Isaac knows he's right where he's supposed to be because the Lord told him to sojourn there. God promised that he would be with Isaac, his presence. He promised to bless him with prosperity. And he promised that one day there'd be a people on these very lands, a people and a place. So holding fast to what's true, Isaac does the next thing. He digs, and he probably wanted to confront those guys. Every one of us would have wanted to confront those guys and put them in their place. So what does the Lord do in response? He closes Isaac's opponent's mouth, and he gives him, Isaac, a place. See, Isaac moves out a little further. He begins digging another well. He finds water, and this time there's no one around to call it out and claim it for themselves. Look at verse 22. Look what Isaac says. Now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. He named the well Rehoboth. I grew up 25 minutes away from a city in Massachusetts called Rehoboth. This isn't it. This is an open place some 19 miles southwest of Beersheba, one in which he can plant his fields and benefit from the crops and the flocks that God has given to him. Friends, we might learn another lesson here from Isaac. The key to facing conflict as God's people is not to resist it, but to accept it. 
to embrace it and then keep being faithful with what God's given to us. The key to facing conflict is God, as God's people is not to resist it. It's to embrace it and then to keep on being faithful despite it. Many of you know that we have a small miniature schnauzer named Ollie. He's ten and a half years old. He's one of the sweetest little creatures I've ever known. He is loyal. He is sweet. And he will let you know how happy he is if you come over our house because he will not start barking at you until you pet him. But you know, to this day, little ten and a half year old Ollie, when I'm walking him, still tries to get his own way. I walk pretty much the same pathway every time I walk him, and there are just these certain places where he thinks that he's going to pull me and bring me over to there when I'm not walking over there, I'm walking that way. And he tries his hardest every single place, every single time, and every single time that little old man chokes himself. Every single time. Because I will not relent. And so if at the first little tug he realized his master was restraining him, he would submit and he would be fine and he would be very happy on his walks. And I think that as I walked Ollie yesterday and thought about this, I am a lot like him in my life with Jesus. And if we're honest, we're all a bit like Ollie, my miniature schnauzer. We really want our own way, don't we? We really do. We demand our own way in this life. And so in His kindness, the Lord sometimes gives us an Esek or a Sitna, a little contention, A little opposition. Why? Because he wants to teach us to submit, not to resist. Because when we resist, we choke ourselves. We make it worse. We we cause pain for ourselves. But friends, when we submit to the Lord's leading, we submit to his restraint. And we keep taking small steps of faith right where we are despite conflict. We begin to discover in time what God was doing all along. What was he doing? God was just making a place for us. God was working to bring us to some space, to a place where we could simply bear fruit for him. Friends, are you facing an Esek this morning, or a sitna, some, some, com- some contention, some opposition. Maybe you're going to work each day, and your job is insanely difficult, as I said earlier. People all around you make it harder. People always think it makes things harder, it seems. And honestly, you just wish you could quit. You're looking on the internet. You're trying to find another job right now, maybe. You want to leave that job. Or kids, maybe you're in school. And the year was kind of fun, like the first day. But now you realize how hard it is. Exams are way harder. I have to study for them. There's kids in my my class. There's this one kid that doesn't like me. It's making it hard for me. Maybe you're sitting at a spiritual. Maybe even... Satan himself is opposing you. And right now your life's just off. You don't know why. And it's hard. And there's strife and conflict waiting for you, it seems, every morning when you wake up. My friend, I want to encourage myself and I want to encourage all of you. Let's learn from Brother Isaac. Hebrews 12 says, Do not resist the discipline of the Lord. No matter if it comes in the form of a classmate or a child or a spouse or even Satan himself, the Lord sovereignly uses all forms 
to discipline the one that he loves. But someone needs to hear this morning, God is not angry at you. God's not angry at you. No, in fact, in fact, God is making space for you. He wants to give you a place. He wants to make room for you so that you would become fruitful. And even though for the moment, Esek and Sitna seem painful rather than pleasant, if you will just but hold on, my friend, and submit to and embrace the opposition, being faithful to get up every day and keep going, soon it will yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who submit to this training. What's your Esek, brother or sister, friend? Name it. Give it a name. Call it for what it really is. Confess before God and to a fellow church member that this is hard but then get up tomorrow, Monday, and keep digging and keep being faithful. The Lord is making room for you to be fruitful. And one day, you're going to look back and you're going to go, oh, okay, that's what you were doing. You actually really are good. You don't hate me. You love me. So after Isaac's fight and his famine, he, the account ends with a feast, verse 23. Again, Isaac gets on the move this time. He's heading northeast near the town of Beersheba. You might recall Beersheba as the place in chapter 21 where his own father Abraham dug the well of the oath and made a treaty with probably another Abimelech and his army commander similar to this. Now here, many decades later, Isaac is again, he's pitched his tent and he's laid down to go to sleep. And once again, the Lord appears to him. And he says so kindly and graciously in verse 24, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, for I am with you and I will bless you and I will multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. So very much like his faithful dad in chapter 21, he builds an altar there and he worships. But then the next day, Isaac's servants are digging for yet another water source and Isaac looks out toward the west and on the horizon he sees a a caravan coming toward him and he recognizes that looks like the king, King Abimelech. Isaac is naturally surprised. First Abimelech suggested that he leave the city and now he's coming to him with his military commander and his assistant, a political and military representation. What is this, some kind of aggression? And so Isaac's response is rather ungracious, even on the verge of belligerence. Obviously fear is at work. Why are you here? Seeing how you despise me and you hate me and you drove me away from your city? Abimelech then responds, not aggressively, but peacefully. And he actually acknowledges the source of Isaac's blessing. He says, Isaac, we can see that the Lord has been with you. Yahweh has been with you. He's obviously referring to the bounty of Isaac's harvest and now a success of finding water. So now Abimelech goes on, since we've done you no harm and we sent you away in peace, which is true, the shepherds of the valley were the ones that gave him the problem, He says, make a peace treaty with us. These guys know that Isaac, just like his dad, has something that they do not. He he has the favor of a very powerful God. They acknowledge the presence of the Lord in his life, confirming the real-time truth of Proverbs 16, verse 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. So Isaac agrees, and he prepares a feast, a a covenant meal. This isn't just simply hospitality, but it symbolizes the confirmation of this peace treaty. And these guys leave. Friends, once again, the Lord answers Isaac's fears 
by giving him peace. Why? Because those who are faithful in little will experience the Lord's blessings. But I wonder, as I look out at my church family in closing, if as you look at your own life right now and you evaluate your life, and I think we ought to do that with accounts like this, you look at your life and you you don't see faithfulness. You feel as though you've been unfaithful. You can see areas in your life where you have allowed compromise. Maybe the big things you've done well. You've been faithful to your spouse. You show up to work on time. You do the best job you possibly can. But when no one's looking and you're tired and and you're weary, you find yourself making concessions for the flesh. You embellish the story a little bit because everybody else's is so much more exciting. Sneak through a few red lights. No one's here. Big deal. Little white lie. Cutting a corner at work. Lingering looks in places that you shouldn't be looking. And so as a result, here now, you kind of feel unsettled. You sort of feel anxious. When deep down, my brother and my sister, it's because we were made to depend on the Lord. And disobedience and unfaithfulness is actually dependence on self. Dear family, I wonder if uh, maybe we needed, need this morning to be reminded of the same reminder that Isaac received from the Lord here that night in Beersheba. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bless you. I will multiply you. Do you know what, friends? This promise is not just for Isaac. It's for every son of Abraham who puts their trust in the Savior. Look look what the Lord says here. He says, I will do this for my servant Abraham's sake. Now listen, that word servant, that title servant is a rare one in Scripture. God only gives certain people that designation. Abraham's one, Moses is one, David is one, and Isaiah's suffering servant is one. The suffering servant, Abraham's greater son, the the one who truly, as Abraham did in verse 5, obeyed God's voice and kept his charge, his commandments, his statutes, his law. Jesus did everything the Father told him to do. On top of that, he chose famine over feasting, rejection over recognition, punishment over prosperity. Why? So that those friends who look to him will never have one second outside of God's life-giving, grace-sustaining presence so that forever we can know the nearness of God? My friend, we may not have been faithful as of late, but Jesus the Savior is. Jesus is. Fear not, for God is with you for his servant Jesus' sake. Look to him now. The more faithful Abraham, David, Isaac, Moses, and don't allow your low opinion of your low opinion of yourself to produce guilt inside of you that you weren't meant to bear. By the way, don't we do that so much? We put this weight on ourselves because we look back and we see all of our unfaithfulness, and we know Jesus is our Savior, but we still keep looking at all that we've done and fail to do. You know, to have a low opinion. A low opinion of ourselves is good. We ought not to be arrogant and proud. But if we have a low opinion of ourselves without looking to Christ and to the benefits that he's purchased for us, we actually have a low opinion of Christ.
when we see fear and failure and condemnation. Friends, it's because it stems from wrong belief about who Jesus is. It stems from the wrong belief that we ought to be better than we really are. And you know what? If the law were still what governed us, that would be true. We ought to be so much better than we are. And the law tells us we are not. That is true. But friends, the gospel, the atoning work of Jesus is not for the fruitful. It's not for the faithful. It's for the faithless. It's for the helpless. Man's difficulty, your spiritual famine and fear is God's opportunity. And the gospel says to you today, brother and sister, and to me, you have failed utterly, yes. But Jesus has succeeded at every point that you failed for you. And then he took the punishment you deserve for your failure to own up, to meet to the standard of the law. And he died and he rose again so that you would never have to be separated from the presence of God in hell. That's what the gospel does for you. That's what Jesus has done. So as Aaron said earlier, my friend, if you have not trusted in Christ, won't you come to him? What are you waiting for? Find rest for your weary labor. My brother and sister, if you are unfaithful, if you've been unfaithful, and we all have, but you are united to Christ, fear not, for God is with you. Own that promise for yourself. Stake your whole life and your future on it. Let it color every fear and famine that you face. And then tomorrow, this afternoon, get up and go and be faithful in the little things. Serve where you are not seen. Kids, obey your parents right away. Mom, keep teaching your kids those things even though they're not listening. Prioritize gathering in the local church. Share your testimony with people that need to be encouraged. Be faithful right where you are. Because God is with you. God is with you. And if I could just say one last thing, and I'll, I'll be quiet. Remain where God has you. Remain where God has you. So, dig, plant, worship, and repeat. Be faithful where God has you and you will experience the richest of blessing. Let's pray.